Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinemdy.com slash podcast. Get CME for this episode by clicking on a CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome Babak Azizadeh. He's a facial plastic surgeon. His Kevin MD article is titled, How to Approach Teen Nose Jobs with Parents. Babak, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Kevin. We'll get into your article in a little bit. First off, briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. Yeah, so I'm in. I'm based in Los Angeles. I did my undergrad med school residency training at UCLA, and then I, and I did my facial plastic surgery fellowship at Harvard and Boston. Not so close to you, but nearby where you are. And your Kevin MD article was about teen nose jobs. Give us some context. How how often does this come up in your practice? So I would say rhinoplasty in young adults and teenagers is very, very common. It's probably, I would say, the number one group of individuals who obtain or want to get rhinoplasty. So managing, you know, teenagers with their parents who are typically paying for the service is complicated and at the same time, actually rewarding because you're navigating a, you know, complex relationship and a complex surgery. So it, it comes up often in my practice. That's the number one group of patients that I operate on, younger adult rhinoplasty. And when you say younger adult, what is the general age range of these young adults? I would say in girls between 16 and 22 and boys 17 and 23. That's generally when, you know, teenagers and college high school students are thinking about their appearance and, you know, want to do something about it if they're being bothered by their, their nasal appearance. So you wrote some great advice in your Kevin MD article, how to approach teen nose jobs with parents. Now tell us, how did your article come together? What were some essential messages that you wanted to share? So number one thing is that I, I approach teenagers with a very serious and impactful approach. They are very well researched when they come in. They are much more researched than when I was a teenager or you were a teenager. They know a lot about the information. The information is typically coming to them through TikTok, hmm. Instagram, but they're knowledgeable. They're very knowledgeable. And you know, you have to speak to them with a lot of expertise, details, and you know, approach them very seriously. And that's really the most important thing. Then next most important thing is navigating, you know, the relationship between the parents and the teenagers. Are the parents on board with this? Are they, did they actually drive this or push this? Or is it the teenager? Ideally, you want both the parents and the teenagers to have, you know, be on the same page. Both are in agreement. Both have done their homework. Both have done their research, and now they're here to get more information. So that is the, the most important aspect. The other thing is it's always okay to wait, right? Mm -hmm. They're young, and they're going to go through some changes. And if they're not on the same page, or there's hesitance, or there's unreasonable expectations, wait it out. It's, do it next summer. You can wait. So I try to really calm down the families in terms of the urgency, because sometimes they'll come and say, oh my God, I want to have this Christmas break. I'm like, no, I don't like doing rhinoplasty and Christmas break, not enough time for recovery. You're rushing things through. Um, so it's really kind of calming down, educating and treating the young adults with really detailed information that they're looking for. So you mentioned that a lot of these teenagers get these ideas and information from social media like TikTok. Do you find that the information that they're coming with from social media, is it accurate information? Do you have to spend a lot of time dispelling what they see online? So it's interesting. The way that I do my consultations have changed so much over the last, I would say, even five years. I actually start out my consultation. I'm like, look, throw everything you know out for a second. I'm going to start, I'm going to educate you on anatomy, aesthetics, what's realistic, what's not realistic. And then we'll get into the, what, you know, you have heard about this. And once you kind of educate and there, again, 
their knowledge base, they've seen surgeries. Many of them have seen yeah. actually live, you know, surgeries online and so yeah. forth. They, they, they get it. They understand it. And they understand that there are, you know, there are pitfalls to the information that they're getting on social media. But sometimes you need to re-educate them. Just like adults, adults come in with the same exact problem. So it's not just teenagers, but they do tend to get their information more on social media than on, let's say, websites or word of mouth that, you know, we're traditionally used to. So for those who aren't familiar with the procedure, let's, let's walk us through the beginning to the end. Talk about some of the common indications that you would see, the procedure itself, the recovery period. And I guess the expectations of what the the final look would be like. Does this walk us through from beginning to end? What would be a, a typical case that you would see? Yeah, so typical case is a patient who comes in unhappy with the appearance of the nose. And, you know, it could be that, you know, they have a big bump. It could be that they have a bulbous tip. It could be that they have a shallow bridge, a variety of different things. And because the nose is really central to our face, we actually don't want a beautiful, perfect nose. We just want a nose that's not distracting and that people can focus on one's eyes. And that's really kind of the most important aspect. So typically people come in if they're unhappy with the, you know, the bridge or the tip. That's kind of, I would say, those two things are the most common reasons they come in. Also, some people have breathing issues. So breathing issues related to either allergies or deviated septum or something in that sense. So we always want to manage those all holistically and together. As far as the surgery goes, it's a very complex surgery. It's not a simple surgery, even though like, oh, it's a little bump or a tip. It's complex because obviously the anatomy is very three-dimensional. There is an artistic aspect to the results in addition to the technical aspects. And the healing process is unconventional. Unlike in almost any other body part, the healing process takes years to finalize. And depending on the techniques used, the individual's anatomy, their skin type, and so forth, you can get a phenomenal healing process, or you could get not such a great healing process. But typically speaking, most kids, they go back to their social activity within a week to 10 days. In three weeks, the nose looks really good. But the final results takes about two to three years to realize the refinements and so forth. And when it's done well, satisfaction rate is actually very good, but it, not many surgeons do it well or do it often enough. It's like kind of robotic surgery that you got to do a lot of it <laughs> to be good at it. You know, anyone can do robotic surgery if they've been trained, but the people who are great at it are the ones who do hundreds and hundreds and have done it over and over again. And it's the same thing. It not only requires that technical gift that some surgeons have, but also the artistic, what looks good, what doesn't look good. Any long-term complications that teams have to be aware of when considering this? Yeah. I mean, I think if the surgery's not performed technically correctly, structurally, the nose, the, the skin is so overpowering that if the nose is not structurally strong, things will change 10 years later, 15 years mm -hmm. later, cartilages can collapse, breathing issues can develop, the nose can get what we call warped and change over time. So that's why the surgeon is very important. The conversation with the surgeon of what you're looking for is very important because you can't just let the surgeon tell you what to do. And you also have to have reasonable expectations of what the surgeon's artistic goals are. And that's where the before and afters come in. The surgeon's experience and expertise comes in. So all of that needs to go in in getting a great outcome with this surgery. So for teenage patients looking for this, and you mentioned that the surgeon's expertise and artistic expertise for that matter is so important. What kind of questions should they ask the doctor in order to find the right surgeon for them? Yeah. I mean, I think number of number of rhinoplasties that that physician does on an annual basis, that's important. Looking at their before and afters because surgeons, you know, we're like, we try to put really good before and afters on, but it shows off our artistic approach 
Because if you don't like someone's before and after, then, you know, that's not going to be the right surgeon. And then also, you know, there are several techniques that surgeons use. Some people kind of like, you know, traditionally it's like, oh, do you do rhinoplasty in the open approach or a closed approach, which are, you know, some technical aspects. If you try to push a doctor to do something they're not used to, you are going to get a bad outcome. So you have to let the doctor say, look, what they're comfortable with. And if you're comfortable with that, then go for it. If you're not comfortable with that, find another surgeon. You mentioned earlier that the best cases are when the teens and the parents are on the same page, right? So for those parents out there, let's say a teen sees something on Instagram or TikTok and they're interested in rhinoplasty. Now, from a parent perspective, what kind of questions should they be asking their teen to, to make sure that this is indeed the right step for them? I mean, I think the number one thing is don't dismiss the research that your children have done. Very few kids come in just like, you know, not thinking about this. Oh, I just want to, you know, I want to get a nose. Yeah. They've done a lot of homework and don't dismiss that. And they're, you know, they're getting their information in a different way, but they are getting some information, some good, some bad, but it's the same, same is true with word of mouth, right? We could get information from somebody that thinks they know everything, but they don't. But really making sure that the motivation of the teen is the correct motivation. And it's not because some other problem or some other issue is happening and they think by getting a rhinoplasty or nose job, they will change that impact. So that is the most important thing that I would say that communication. The other thing is some parents force their children to have this surgery. And I really believe that's wrong. And I'm not saying that, you know, it doesn't happen. And maybe we, we think, oh my God, I wish my kid had this or that. But I, I think that's putting a lot of pressure. This is a lifelong surgery. Yeah. And it's okay to bring it up and say, hey, you know, if you're not happy with the appearance of your nose, there you can have surgery. But pushing your kid or making them feel bad about themselves because of a physical feature that you don't like is really creating lifelong trauma and problems in children that will become very insecure adults. Now take us into your exam room. What were some cases that raised red flags for you that you personally saw that made you think, hey, this isn't the right thing for that teen? Yeah. So whenever someone comes in with a lot of minutia, I don't like this little shadow. I don't like that. That's, that's a major red flag. Rhinoplasty or any plastic surgery is really about the global changes. Look, I don't like the appearance of my nose. I'd like to improve it, that appearance. But when someone says, oh, I don't like this shadow. And I think I need to use a spreader graft to improve that. <laughs> or they're telling me technical terms that the, that that person will end up having an unsatisfactory result because they probably have some other issues that need to be dealt with, like body dysmorphic syndrome and other more complicated psychological issues. So that I would say is the most important thing that we want to avoid. The other thing is some people come and you know have like, look, I don't like this bump. And I think I'm going to look a hundred times better doing it. That's not the case. You know, generally speaking, you know, we want to give feedback to uh, young adults or, you know, teenagers about like, what is this impact going to really make? It's probably not going to make that much impact that they're thinking. Now, on the other hand, a really great example of when this surgery really helps is I had a teenager, young 15 year old girl, and she had a very large, unattractive, masculine nose on a female. She was being bullied from the age of, you know, 10. She stopped going to school because of it. And they had searched all around the country. And, you know, because we have a lot of, you know, kind of like traditional ways of approaching things with age and so forth, which I'm not a big believer. I think we have to look at each individual differently. And after she, we did a rhinoplasty on her. And after that, 
She started wearing, you know, going to school, socializing, her life changed. So this is something that actually in a lot of children that have, it, we have to look at it more like, you know, how we treat like lop ears mm -hmm. and impact that can have a tremendous impact in their social psychosocial impact. Same thing with rhinoplasty. When someone has a, a nose that does not fit their face and is a big distracting feature and people are teasing them left and right, that's something that we can fix and help. So there are times that it's not so frivolous. It's not so just like, you know, you know, major, you know, subtle problem. And I think it can be very impactful in those individuals. In general, what percentage of teens who come to your clinic are indeed appropriate candidates for rhinoplasty? I would say about 75 to 80%. It's actually a high percentage. And it may be skewed because of my practice, but I would say the majority are very knowledgeable. They've done their homework. They have a real issue that they're concerned with, which I think can benefit. And they come in with knowledgeable parents. 20% of the time they fall into categories, either the parents, the young adult, or the issue, or they have some other psycho psychosocial issues that's not going to be amenable to surgery. And what is the general price range for, for this procedure? That's a great question. And that really varies, I, I would say, from region to region, as well as from expertise of the surgeon. The very top notch experts around the country probably charge in the range of fifteen to thirty thousand dollars. But you can probably find a rhinoplasty somewhere for five thousand, six thousand, ten thousand dollars. But it is an operation, interestingly enough, Kevin, I had this operation myself. That's one of the reasons like I was like, you know, really attracted to this this surgery. And I had a crooked nose. I was like growing up like teased all the time. But the doctors that were in my price range when I was a kid, I didn't have a very high price range. My parents didn't, couldn't afford it. I hated the result. I didn't like the results they were producing. So I just waited until I could afford the surgeon that I thought had the best results and had it. So you can wait. I mean, you, this is not something you should rush into. It is something that you should take your time and make sure that you find the right surgeon and you're doing it at the right time for yourself. And if you're, you know, a young adult or teenager doing it, you know, in collaboration with your family's, I guess, blessings in a way. Would you say it is a correlation between price and expertise of the surgeon? I would say yes. And it's a very rare thing. I would say that I would say yes, because I know the top, top doctors in the country and they're the ones who have refined their artwork. They have spent years perfecting and learning. And they're not rushing and doing 100 of these a week. They're doing two, three, four surgeries a week. And they're spending a lot of hours. So they are going to charge more than someone who is maybe fresh out of training or doesn't do it that often or is, has a mill factory where they're doing three, four surgeries a day, five days a week. So I would say yes, but with an asterisk. We're talking about back as he's a day. He's a facial plastic surgeon is Kevin MD articles titled how to approach teen nose jobs with parents. Babak, tell us some of your take home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. Yeah. I mean, I think like any other situation, communication is really important between the teenager and the parents. That's number one, doing your basic homework and research, having reasonable expectations. These surgeries are not going to change people's lives with certain exceptions, as I outlined. And, you know, seeing a couple of doctors, making sure that the artistic side of it is as important as the technical side. And once those are all brought together, I think this is an amazing operation that could change, really be very impactful in people's lives. Babak, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. Thanks again for being on the show. Thank you, Kevin. It's really an honor.